coast is a beautifully complicated place. It's incredibly diverse, it counts for nearly a third of Texas's economy. But trash on beaches is a constant threat to all of it, people and wildlife. And marine litter is merely a symptom of an even bigger problem. We need the next generation to understand it's their responsibility to be stewards of the coastline. There's a lot at stake. acronym for stopping plastics and litter along shorelines. The Texas coastline is incredibly biodiverse and marine litter is a constant threat to all of it, people and wildlife. The goal of the SPLASH program is to create a cleaner environment for people, birds, and other wildlife in the Houston-Galveston region. It's a multifaceted effort that includes beach cleanups like you're seeing here today. This is actually our 95th cleanup that we've done in the past three years. We love living near Texas beaches. It's such a treat to come out here and feel the breeze and the water and have a sunny day with the family. We visit several times a year and there usually is a lot of litter and so we do try to help pick it up when we're out here. We really feel like it's important for us to learn how we can prevent this from happening and help and be a part of the solution and keeping it clean. Splash isn't just a beach cleaning service. We want Texans to understand where the trash comes from. What are those sources? Splash is designed by its partners to address that information gap. There's a lot of different ways that litter can end up on our coastline. A lot of it gets here from rivers, waterway runoff. We also get a lot from the Houston Ship Channel and the Mississippi River, as well as international trash that the Gulf of Mexico currents push up here. Plus, some of it is from problematic trash management. That's why Splash hosts several educational events year-round in the community. So taking it a step beyond beach cleanups and outreach events, we have to make that connection with land managers, with the practitioners, and work with them to come up with data-driven solutions that will reduce marine debris and litter on our shorelines. The data collection aspect is paramount because we want to know where progress is being made. So we work with all of our amazing partners to collect and analyze the data and target hot spots within our communities so that we can help reduce the amount of trash that's there and figure out why it's there. This location is actually super important because it used to be a hot spot for American oyster catcher entanglements. After the first splash cleanup, they have not found another entangled American oyster catcher. So it's very positive to see the impact we're having on these species. For those of us of a certain age, when we see a six pack holder, we know we have to dispose of it properly so that it doesn't become a hazard to wildlife. We would love for Splash to accomplish that messaging, that kind of understanding among Texans. As a parent who takes their kids outside in nature a lot, I do think it's important for them to learn how to keep it clean and what it takes to preserve it. We've got to do better, and I hope my children do take this experience to heart. Whenever we go out into the community, I'm super encouraged because people want to help. It's so nice to work for an organization and have a cause that everyone can get behind. Going forward, I'm super optimistic about the Splash program and the impact it's going to have on the Texas coastline. Welcome back from lunch. I hope everyone had a great meal and some great conversations. Um, it's so exciting to see everyone here. This has been our largest in-person audience that we've had in the history of the summit. So thank you so much for being here and for being excited about this event. 
For those joining virtually, don't forget you can ask questions and engage in dialogue on the YouTube stream or at info at texanbynature.org. For those that don't know me, I'm Jenny Burden. I'm the Director of Development at Texan by Nature. We can't have a discussion about the future of conservation without diving into models that are changing the behaviors, actions, and conversations taking place among stakeholders. The models that we can emulate and evolve, models that are demonstrating education, application, measurement, reporting, and that are building on collaboration to do so. Thomas Edison once said, keep on the lookout for novel ideas that others have used successfully. Your idea has to only be original in its adaptation to the problem you're working on. The beauty of this annual summit is the diversity of projects, goals, practices, industries, and organizations represented. It is, it's a true opportunity for us to come together, share, and build on novel ideas and best practices. In particular, water is a universally needed and unfortunately, litter is a universal issue that is intertwined with our waterways around the world. Building on best practices such as sound data, community action, and universal reporting are highlights of the next panel. Our speakers, our speakers have tackled this issue from different perspectives. They've take, taken novel thinking and best practice application to new and impactful levels. You'll hear about on the ground action, tools for aggregated reporting, keys for industry leadership, and innovative projects and partnerships. Emulating these in Texas and around the globe can create a thriving future for people and for natural resources alike. As we hear from these leaders, I hope you'll think about how their learnings and models relate to your own organization and projects. What if you took some of their methods and applied them differently, adapted them, how can we accelerate progress by building on each other's innovation and success? Today you'll hear from Maya Corbett, President, Texans for Clean Water, Liz Virgil, Texas Coastal Education Specialist from the American Bird Conservancy, and Liz Donahue, Director of Government Relations in Rosarka. Similar to the previous panels, you'll hear each presentation in succession and then we'll join the speakers for a Q&A after the presentations are complete. For virtual attendees, feel free to submit your questions with the YouTube channel or to info at texanbynature.org. Please join me in thanking these speakers as we welcome Maya to the podium. Well, thank you, Jenny, and thank you, Joni, First Lady, and all of you who took the time to be here in person, biggest crowd yet, very exciting, and everyone out there in cyberspace. Uh, I'm really excited to be here, and what an opening. Uh, that is uh, so appropriate to what we're going to talk about today. And yes, I am Texans. We, we are Texans for Clean Water. And uh, our group was founded about a decade ago by business folks and philanthropists uh, who looked out their back doors and were kayakers themselves and, and saw things that just weren't supposed to be. Uh, and uh, we have dedicated ourselves to find data-driven, collaborative solutions to those problems uh, that aren't a reinvention of the wheel. That was a great uh, quote, Jenny. Uh, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We can, we can find what's working and roll it on to what we're doing. So, rolling on to some dirty pictures. Ooh. <laughs> Whoa. Yes, yeah, so this is my, we're going to need a bigger boat picture. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, this is not too terribly uncommon. One of the founders of Texans for Clean Water took this picture. And this is on one of the bayous in Houston. And as the video showed, the, the bayous, they flow into the Gulf and they flow by and through critical habitat and, uh, and beautiful spaces, beautiful wild spaces that we all want to enjoy and need uh, for our generation and so many future generations to come. So how do we stop this from happening? I will also say that um, our group, 
we clean, we clean it up. You know, we, we help to clean up this mess after we took this picture. Uh, and our group also supports Buffalo Bayou Partnership, uh, which, uh, which has a crew of, of folks. Bayou Dave, you should look up Bayou Dave. He's got some great YouTube videos. And uh, they take crews out five days a week, every week of the year, and they literally vacuum, they've got a vacuum boat, and they vacuum the top of water, of, of from all this trash. And, and in fact, they're the, one of the last lines of defense before all that stuff blows down through the Gulf and to some of the beautiful uh, areas that we saw in that, uh, that earlier video. So this is not an away problem. I think someone had a question earlier about, well, we sent all this waste to other places and then you know, it trash those waterways. Well, we're trashing our waterways right here. Uh, so it is not an away problem. It's a here problem too. But it's a problem that we can solve. And first we've got to figure out what is the problem. An earlier speaker talked about metrics. And if you don't measure what you, what you have, then, then how can you care about it? How can you sustain it? How can you make it any better if you don't really understand what's there? So, data. But, but we've got lots of great data in Texas. Lots of great data about terrible things. Uh, and, uh, and, and data is really important. And, and so TxDOT, our, our, our Department of Transportation here, they do a phenomenal job of they go out and they actually count each piece of litter. And uh, some, we've heard about weights, and, and weights are very important. Weight, weighting, weighing things is a, it's a good, easy way of, of figuring out kind of a, a differentiation and trends. Plastic is really lightweight. And 50% uh, or more of the stuff that we're picking up by volume and sending to landfills is plastic. And uh, so you see here, what else is it? What is it? It's, it's beverage stuff and it's food stuff. It's stuff that we're eating and drinking along the way. And, uh, and where is it? Uh, it's it's a lot of, mostly plastic and it's mostly found on farm to market roads. And if you notice, I don't have one of those little blinky light things, which is probably for the better. Someone would go blind. But uh, if you notice there on the farm to market, that lower uh, right hand uh, chart there, farm to market roadways are by far and exponentially uh, the most amount of, of roadway miles that we have in the state. And so if all that litter is on all those roadways, what does it do to our waterways? Well, that's what it does. This is a map of the farm market roadways as it relates to the Texas waterways and our water courses. And it's like a bowl of spaghetti. So this is to illustrate that whatever blows or flows from a roadway is going into a water course. Uh, and if you'll also notice, we're a drain. It drains. Texas waters, they drain into the Gulf and they drain down through Houston and some other areas that are, again, critical habitat and beautiful spaces, beautiful spaces for, for, for people uh, and, uh, and, and recreation. And, and you know what else we have? We have other drains. We have stormwater drains in Texas. And this is critical infrastructure, critical infrastructure that keeps us from flooding, uh, that uh, moves uh, water to where it needs to go for environmental flows. Uh, and it also can look like this. And unfortunately, this is uh, another picture taken by one of our board members. And it is, it is not uncommon. It is not uncommon that uh, our, again, critical infrastructure is being clogged by, you know, somebody's, somebody's bad deed. You know, and I love that everybody earlier was talking about, you know, we need to work with those who, who hold our values and we're all good people in this room and we are and it's a nice thing for it. But, you know, that, that, that isn't everybody. And that's, you know, we, we have to meet people where they are and, you know, not everybody sees this as a, as a, as a real problem. Uh, not everybody sees it as, as their problem. Uh, and so I think it's incumbent on us to find solutions, uh, not just through dare I say, altruism and, and doing good works, but uh, you know, find other things that, that work, like uh, incentives, sometimes disincentives. Uh, but there are other things that we can put in play uh, to make this not the reality that we face every day. And more data, more data. Data is very important, as we say, and as we, we learn throughout uh, this, this event. 
And we, Texas for Clean Water, are also working with Keep Texas Beautiful. Suzanne is in the audience somewhere. Oh, shout out to Suzanne. And uh, this was a real collaborative uh, project that we, we did. And in fact, many of the, the, the COGs, North Central Texas COG, uh, well, there were some, some former COG folks here and, and um, worked on how do we maintain ongoing monitoring and evaluation of this, this litter problem in waterways. TxDOT, again, does a great job, but it's a study that they do you know, every, every other year at best. Uh, but this is an ongoing problem. So we need ongoing monitoring and, and evaluation. And so this is uh, the text litter database. I encourage you all to Google it and go on. And, and uh, it is the first, we're the first state in the nation as a central repository for all this litter data. And so that really helps us to figure out, uh, again, what is it, where is it? And that'll help us figure out how do we do something about it. And so here's some things that we do about it. Uh, we put solutions uh, to the test. And uh, on the, on, well, I will say that what is working, again, you know, not, not in renting, reinventing the wheel, but figuring out whose wheel is rolling pretty good. Uh, there are 10 states in the United States uh, that have policy in place that provides incentives, a financial incentive for the public to return their, their wasted material, their bottles and cans, for a financial incentive. Uh, and they have a convenient collection system by which people can find where I'm supposed to put this thing and then put it there. And I might get five, 10 cents back. Uh, and that's the incentive for folks who maybe aren't doing it because they're good people. And that's all right. You know, and sometimes we have to put engineering to work. Sometimes we have to put anthropology to work. And uh, that is, there was something we said about, uh, about the human animal. Uh, and so if you want somebody to do something, a lot of times you pay them to do it and you provide them a convenient outlet with which to, to do it. And so Keep America Beautiful uh, did a, a 2020 litter study, which was a, a really seminal study, fantastic work, and they found 152 pieces of litter on the ground across the nation for every man, woman, child that lives in these, this great United States. 152 pieces of litter. And that is, uh, that's an improvement, if you can, if you can believe it, uh, over, the, over the, the last study they did. Uh, but one thing, again, what we're trying to do is we want to be put out of business. We, we're tired of cleaning up rivers. Uh, we really want to stop stuff getting in there in the first place. And so one really cool thing that came out of this study was that in those 10 states where they provide five or 10 cents incentive for folks, and they have collections that are you know, available and convenient, uh, those states have 50% less litter on their roadways. That's pretty good. And they have 30% less litter in their waterways. That's real good. And uh, for all you data scientists out there, I mean, that's what you call a statistical success. Uh, and so how can we here utilize those, again, what's working to figure out how it can work for us? So I was very pleased to work with, with Joni and, and, and Taylor, who did the work of, of, of a thousand, wherever she is. Um, and, and we had a pilot program in uh, El Paso with Ozarka, so I won't, I won't take too much of Liz's thunder. Uh, but we collectively came together with Sam's Club and Walmart uh, to put these, uh, this, these little uh, kiosks, we'll call it, in their parking lots. And we, we gave uh, folks 10 cents per piece of plastic they brought back to us. Uh, and it was, a, it was a resounding success. And for you know, a, a pretty low financial impact, uh, we got a huge impact in the understanding that, you know, people want to do the right thing. Education has worked. You know, we have educated people, they want to recycle. Someone says, I recycle everything. I wash it and then I recycle it. So education has worked. So now we need to provide people the tools to do what we're asking them to do. And so little of the state of Texas can even recycle. Uh, and so what we need to do is provide that overarching infrastructure and, and provide that convenience to get people to do what, what, what oftentimes they want to do or that we want them to do. So a couple other ways, it's not always bottles and cans. Uh, Cameron County 
the beautiful beaches of, of South Padre Island, they've got a cash for trash program. Uh, they give you a, a mesh bag and you pay $5 and when you come back and with a bag full of trash, they give you your $5 back. Uh, that is a way to incentivize behavior. And uh, also at the, the recent Austin City Limits Festival, for all of you guys who went to the ACL Fest in Austin, uh, they had a trash for t-shirts. You bring back a bag of trash and you get a t-shirt. So again, we're, we're this is a, incentives and convenience has been proven to work. So how can we not reinvent the wheel but make it work for us? And so that is what we're trying to do here at, uh, at Texas for Clean Water is take the data, learn what the problem is, and find solutions that, uh, that can work for us here in Texas. So another what we do is collaboration across the value chain. So many of you here earlier, the early speakers said, well, I talked to community, I talked to government, I talked to business. That is essential. We, we, it, the, the collaboration across the, the, again, value chain. This was the value chain of our, of our El Paso pilot, so it had retail and producers and recyclers, but everyone has a value chain. We are a value chain. And so I, you know, real kudos to the Caddo Lake and all of the folks who spoke earlier about really reaching out to find who are those partners, uh, find some sort of baseline of commonality and grow from there. Really uh, important. So how do people get involved? This is my last slide, Joni, don't worry. She's about to get up on me. So how can people get involved? Well, I say, you know, to my industry friends and brethren, let's move past the status quo. Sometimes we find sustainability officers and they're just the nicest folks and they say, God, that's great. I tell you, that's just wonderful. And then sometimes you sit down with the GR folks and they say, well, that's just never gonna happen. And then you say, oh darn, you know? So I would say that moving past what, what may not have worked in the past. You know, there might have been policies that, you know, were scary or they didn't work as they intended. But, you know, it is 2023. We've got AI. Someone said artificial intelligence. We've got all sorts of stuff now. So we can maybe not reinvent a wheel, make a better wheel. You know, we know what, what rolls. So let's, let's, let's look at it with fresh eyes. You know, leave the status quo behind and see how we can move forward. Like Joni said, we're moving into the future. Uh, so let, all those days to go into the next year, let's figure out how to move them to the future. And for my NGO friends and brethren, you know, embrace your advocacy. Sometimes you'll find folks say, oh, we can't lobby. Oh, we can't, we can't talk to politicians, they're very scary. And, uh, but you know, you're, you're important. Your voice matters. What you know is, is how we are going to change. Uh, and so embrace that. It's scary. This is scary. Uh, but here we are, you know, and, and we're, we're, we're pushing through the fear because on the other side is progress. So again, I, I would just say work together. Don't be scared of each other, NGOs and industry. Uh, we can come together and we can collaborate and uh, that collaboration can clean up Texas and hopefully stop us from having to. And with that, I sure appreciate you. Thank you and keep in touch. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Liz Virgil, and I'm the Education Specialist um, with American Bird Conservancy. Um, I'm super excited to be here today to talk to you guys about Splash, which is that video that you guys um, watched just a couple minutes ago. Um, so I hope to talk to you guys about our uh, collaborative trash mitigation program and how we're on the ground in Houston, Galveston region, um, what we do and our impacts. Um, so some of you are probably familiar with, with trash in, on the streets, in your neighborhood, in your parks, in your waterways. Um, trash is very prevalent in Texas, and in fact, we are known to be the trashiest state. Um, according to NOAA and the Ocean Conservancy, uh, they, they conducted a survey and they found that we are the trashiest state per mile. And we're also accumulating trash 10 times faster on our coastlines um, due to our, our inshore currents and the fact that all of our waterways are leading to our coast. Um, so we're seeing those impacts in a number of ways. Um, it is uh, specifically decreasing our environmental health out on our coast. It's affecting our bird populations. It's affecting our wildlife populations. Um, it's also impacting uh, the human health in those communities. They're having uh, to deal with 
um, unclean waters, unclean spaces. They have limited uh, access to nature, safe, safe nature uh, areas. Um, and it's also impacting our tourism um, in our local economy. Um, less tourists want to come to a trashy beach. Less tourists want to um, spend money uh, in Galveston or in our, on our other coastlines because we have trash there. Um, let's see. And so these are just some pictures that, that we see pretty uh, consistently out on our coast. Uh, we're seeing shorebirds in the spring um, nesting in and around trash. We're seeing evidence of uh, sea turtle bites in the plastics that show up on our coastlines. Um, we're also seeing a lot of illegal dumping. Um, so people who are going out to our beaches and leaving their um, their, their beach trash behind, their uh, tents that they, they love to use in Texas. Um, they leave those behind because they break from the wind. Uh, grills, uh, we see uh, crazy things. The craziest thing that we've ever seen at a cleanup uh, was a taxidermy goat, fun fact. It's pretty crazy. <laughs> Wild stuff out there. Um, but unfortunately, all that stuff is impacting our wildlife. Um, we're also seeing a lot of birds in, uh, uh, getting entangled, um, and unfortunately, a lot of mortality of birds out there as well. So, knowing those uh, facts, not seeing the impacts, American Bird Conservancy, Gulf Coast Bird Observatory, and Black Hat GIS came together in 2020, in the peak of the pandemic, to start SPLASH, uh, which stands for Stopping Plastics and Litter Along Shorelines. So, our mission is to create cleaner environments for birds, for people, and for other wildlife in the Houston-Galveston region. Um, and we do that uh, through a number of ways. Uh, we try to accomplish a number of goals. And one, like Maya was talking about, is to understand the problem. Um, I think nationally they say cigarette butts is the most abundant uh, trash item nationally. Uh, we're seeing different. Um, so that speaks to the importance of understanding your local um, issues, your local problems. So we're trying to figure out what trash are we seeing out on our coastlines, where are the hot spots, can we identify sources, all to share with you all, all to share with stakeholders so that we can um, create better, uh, better solutions. Uh, we also want to educate our communities, educate our youth, so that we can uh, plant seeds for future environmental stewards um, and provide them with sustainable actions, uh, sustainable skills, uh, so that they can make better decisions for the future. All of our solutions are collaborative. Um, it is so important to uh, investigate who is at the table and who isn't. Who can we get involved? Um, how can they help? How can we work with communities in order to create effective solutions? Um, and then all you know, in the hopes of creating a cleaner ecosystem so that we don't have a job anymore. <laughs> uh, fortunately, unfortunately, right? So we do this a number of ways. Uh, we reach out to our, like I said, local communities through speaking engagements, um, through community events. We also host at least monthly, once a month cleanups uh, that we get volunteers involved, partners involved. Um, we also reach schools and um, informal educators through classroom lessons, educators' guides. Uh, we provide field trips. Uh, we like to get them involved in art contests, so not just focusing on science concepts, but um, getting them involved in artistic, creative ways. And we also have lots of online resources. Um, let's see, another huge way that we get the community involved is by uh, getting them involved in our uh, data collection. So at nearly every cleanup, we um, collect the, the trash data, we organize it, and um, we enter it into the Texas Litter Database so that uh, statewide we can better understand what's going on on our coastlines. And we also have our own story map to tell the story of trash out in Houston and Galveston. So overall, combining those uh, things, we hope to encourage behavior change where um, it's a norm to use a um, reusable water bottle, it's a norm to use reusable shopping bags, um, doing norm to participate in our cleanups and, and other cleanups. Um, we hope to support community action and ultimately create um, trash mitigation strategies, which are long-term strategies that we're working with communities to um, impact a specific area for a specific goal, um, so to speak. And these are, um, to date, we've done actually over 100 cleanups now. And we've uh, improved over 800 acres and overall have removed 36,000 pounds of trash, which is really awesome. Yeah.
Yeah, thank you. It's really incredible too, knowing that it's people on the grounds using their hands, using gloves, using bags, uh, using their hard work and their strength to remove all this trash out there. So it's really awesome. Um, but to, to the point of our data, we're seeing a lot of styrofoam fragments out on our coastlines. We're seeing a lot of uh, plastic fragments, we're seeing bottle caps, and we're seeing fishing line. And I think that this speaks to the fact that um, trash is moving as far north as Dallas, and it can even be um, as far north as Canada uh, through the Mississippi River Basin. But we're getting trash from all over, not just Texas out here. And through that process of transportation, it's getting broken up. Um, and then you can imagine all the wildlife out there that are attracted to that trash thinking it's food and ending up ingesting it. So we need to work towards um, figuring out solutions towards uh, styrofoam mitigation out here in Texas to improve our coastlines. Uh, so outside of removing trash, understanding trash, we're also seeing community impacts. Um, we do a lot of work with students and schools in Houston and Galveston, and we ask them to take surveys before and after our programming. So we found that over 50% of students uh, have felt more motivated to reduce their use of certain single-use items. And they've also not only been motivated to reduce their use of single-use items, but encourage others to do it. So again, it's speaking to that um, planting seeds for environmental stewards, encouraging them to be advocates in their own way as well. And on top of that, uh, we are seeing a decrease in oyster catcher entanglements um, at Texas City Dyke, which is a huge hotspot for trash. It collects a lot of it in the rocks. Um, and so we do a lot of cleanups out there, but a lot of organi other organizations do that too. So um, it's really awesome, the collaboration, um, that how we're working together all along just the dike, and we're seeing that wildlife improvement. Um, okay, so what works? Uh, a lot of things like collaboration, partnership, um, education, uh, those are a lot of things that people have been speaking about throughout the day. Um, and we're finding that that, of course, does work, uh, working with communities and for them. So as much as we are out there um, talking about trash, we're also asking them questions. We're trying to figure out what are their needs, what are communities' needs, what are their obstacles, how can we create a support system so that they can create their own community action and create those uh, mitigation strategies um, so that it's much more long-term change outside of just doing cleanups. Um, this graphic shows a, kind of a snapshot of the different organizations that we've worked with. So it's a wide range anywhere from educational organizations like Houston Zoo, who's here, shout out, <laughs> to um, oil and gas, to uh, private industry who's looking for service projects or wanting to get involved. Um, we kind of cast a wide net and we hope to bring everyone, <laughs> excuse me, to the table. Um, someone asked about accessibility early, and I think it's a great question, and I think the next step to conservation is to talk about accessibility. Again, who's at the table and how can we bring them there? So we try to do that through providing free programming. Um, so all of our educational events are free to educators. We also have um, sustainable products that we provide to our volunteers and, and at um, community events so that we aren't just encouraging them to be sustainable, but we're actually giving them excuse me, those skills to do so and those, those uh, items to do so to make it much easier. And so ways that you can get involved is to consider your own behaviors. Um, how can you change what you do at your home or your office? And we are um, here and available and want to talk to you about that and want to collaborate with you all to um, figure out how we can be a more sustainable community in, in Texas. Um, so please keep in touch. Uh, we have our website QR code, our newsletter QR code, and um, I want to give a special shout out to Texas by Nature. Thank you so much for this opportunity and and thank you, Kenzie, for your support. Really appreciate it. Um, but I'll put this back up. So thank you guys. <laughs> Good afternoon. It is an honor to present to you today um, and to have this opportunity to learn alongside you as well. Thank you to Mrs. Bush and Joni and the entire team at Texans for Nature for this opportunity. Uh, first, I, I am government relations for Blue Triton Brands, but I'm, I'm a good one, Maya. I am very <laughs> proactive. I'm not a no. 
Um, so no one knows who Blue Triton is, so I'll introduce us. We're an independent uh, beverage company, home and office delivery service with a 175 year legacy of trusted brands like Ozarka Spring Water. Our business is drinking water and keeping our water sustainable is the only way we stay in business and keep our business sustainable. We are building a better water company. Ozarka brand natural spring water was founded in 1905. We have four plants in Texas and three springs and nearly 900 employees. Ozarka is one of our six regional spring water brands. We prefer to keep our water regional and, uh, and local. So conserving water resources uh, today is critical to protecting the water for generations to come. That's why we prioritize, oh, I'm sorry. That's why we prioritize water stewardship and resilient sourcing. We safeguard more than 20,000 acres across North America, that's watersheds and wetlands, and in Texas alone we have more than 9,000 acres in conservation. That sounds really small compared to the numbers we talked about this morning, um, but we agree with the statement that was articulated earlier that it pays to invest in nature. At Blue Triton, we have a dedicated team of natural resource managers who actively manage, manage all of our sites. We have more than 50 spring sites across North America. Trey Mixon is our Texas manager. He's been there for a long time. And he represents everything that is good about our, um, our, our team. At Blue Triton, we talk about three really important values. We want to be deeply committed, boldly innovative, and fiercely good to the communities we operate in and to our customers. Trey embodies all of that, and we carry that through as, um, across, across the country. Which brings us to collaborative partnerships. Oops. Um, you can't be fiercely good without good collaborative partners. Besides the recycling collaboration that we're going to talk about in a minute, we have had um, two great long-term partnerships. One is with 4G Honey. A couple years back, when a bee's nest was found at our loading dock at our Hawkins facility, instead of destroying it, a partnership was formed with the local FFA at, the Haw at Hawkins High School. Today, we have 30 hives on our property and more than 60 students engaged. It's an award-winning program um, and it's been highly successful. Because our property is designed and managed to preserve the integrity of the environment and the watershed, it is prime real estate for bees and we are very lucky to have this partnership. The second one is with the Meadow Center. Uh, and for years, we have been supporting the engagement of more than 11,000 citizen scientists who monitor more than 400 sites across Texas. And just last month, we announced a new partnership for the next three years that will take to scale this community science across the state and enhance sustainability education on site in San Marcos. So that's our biodiversity cred. We also care about getting rid of litter and we want our bottles back, these bottles back. Number one PET is very easily recycled and we wanna make sure that we're fostering a circular economy. So we're going bottle to bottle um, as we move forward. At Blue Triton, we have a goal to hit 35% recycled content by 2025. We are on track to do that. Um, so we, we need those bottles back. They are an important feedstock to, for our future. Um, so not only are we gonna protect the environment, but we're gonna actually uh, make sure we're doing the responsible thing moving forward. Uh, we already know PT poses a threat to our waterways and our health, and uh, so we, we gotta keep forging on with these partnerships. In Texas, the recycling rate for PET is only 11%. It is only 2% for thermal forms or clamshells. Um, to the recycling enthusiasts this morning, your children wanted me to tell you, you are 10% of that 11%, so you're doing a great job. Um, if um, Houston and San Antonio were recycling in a comprehensive way, it would double the US recycling rate. So it's very important. <laughs> so we joined forces with 
uh, Texans for Clean Water, Texans by Nature, and Sam's Club to try a voluntary recycling incentive program to reduce litter and get consumers recycling. It was a six-month pilot program at four Sam's Clubs in El Paso. Uh, Maya explained a bit about a deposit return system. I live in this policy world all the time, so I take it completely for granted, like everyone knows what we're talking about. Um, but a deposit return system that is effective has about an 85% collection rate, and it tends to, or not tends to be, it is a performance-based system that is customer-centric, that's incredibly important. It's an inclusive circular system, so it's not just plastic ultimately, but aluminum and glass as well. And it is producer-led and is transparent and accountable, right? That goes right back to measurement. How it works, right? You have some kind of return, place to return. In this case, we use large, colorful receptacles. There is a, in this, uh, an incentive, 10 cents in the pilot program, and the only state Right now, that has a 10 cents is Oregon. Connecticut is moving to a 10 cent incentive um, in 2024. And once you drop it off, you're, you get a payment. In this case, it was automatic. Uh, just you download in an app, you got credited for what you donated, you um, recycled. And then a pickup agent comes, brings it to the recycling processor, and hopefully someone in industry like Blue Triton will come around and purchase that RPET and then make new bottles for it. This pilot program differed because it was voluntary. In everywhere else that this operates in the US, it's mandated. Not that everyone participates. I admit I don't, I don't participate. I put my recycling out at curbside. Um, but things are changing because we are learning how to be more convenient and to meet customers where they are. So, uh, this pilot was incredibly successful. Um, and we saw month over month growth in those six months. And it continues, it continued on past the original six month and it just kept going. With the acceptance of PET bottles, which everyone knows is recyclable, and large receptacles and paid marketing, the project saw a 236% growth in the number of active users per month and 388% growth in materials from September to January. There was a lot to measure and there's a great report online by Texans by Nature um, that if you wanna get into the data, there's a lot to get into. Um, but it matters how, how you communicate and how you market it and how people respond to that. Um, so, We'll get into our lessons learned. This is an adaptive and technical challenge recycling. We know that it takes a dynamic system that is going to be responsive to consumers in particular. Convenience matters most of all. Um, and we know, we all know this already, money works. Um, if you provide people with an incentive, you make it easy for them, they're going to respond. Clear messaging and outreach also make a huge difference and they learned in this pilot, it's gotta be in English and Spanish and it's gotta come through in multiple channels. It's gotta, they enlisted Sam's Club to talk to their members, uh, Ozarka put stuff out as well and, um, and ultimately there was paid advertising to both social and I believe on radio too. So that all makes a difference in driving up um, people's knowledge of what to do and where to go. Uh, the easier you make it, the better the success is going to be. And then lastly, on the technical side, um, there were infrastructure gaps that were found in the pilot. It is hard to make all of these different connections and not all the recycling is available that we want to be. So um, everything was recycled from this pilot, but it was downcycled. So thermoforms and number one PET in bottles doesn't go back to bottles, it goes back to thermoforms. Um, and we wanna to get to a place where we're going back to bottles. So that's one of the lessons learned, but that can be overcome. So there's hope here. And ultimately, I feel like I'm just validating everything everyone else said today, um, is it takes partnership. You gotta have all of us at the table to make this happen, to get to a better place. And we gotta remember that consumers are at the center of that. Thank you very much, I really appreciate it.
All right, thank you again to our speakers. Um, we do have some time for our Q&A. Um, so if we have questions, once again, raise your hands real high so our staff with the microphones can come and find you. And if you are virtual, make sure you can submit to our YouTube stream or to info at texanbynature.org. So who's first? Okay, go ahead. Yeah, just a quick question. Um, on the, when you're returning the um, PET, how do you know, or how does the machine know what they're putting through? Well, there are different ways. Um, the, the newest way to do deposit returns is to do a bag drop system, and once the bags are collected um, and it's sorted out, when it's sorted, they'll clear the, um, the technology used is usually uh, some kind of optical scan. We'll, we'll count how many and what type are going through. Um, there is one particular system, the uh, Clink model, which is used in, in Maine and upstate New York, where they'll then communicate back to the consumer what, what should have been included and what, sh what is not allowed in the system. So there's a, a back and forth in terms of the, um, that engagement, which is really helpful. Um, everything, and I think the Letitia from TDS pointed this out, I mean, everything imaginable comes through, so you have to be prepared for that. Um, but that it identified after the fact. In other places, they use a reverse vending machine where you put in one bottle at a time and it reads the UPC code. It's not as convenient, and so it doesn't work as well. <laughs> okay. Um, so I think the incentive program is great. I've seen it like in you know certain areas of town in Houston, but um, has there been any discussion around maybe building an incentive program or partnering with like office towers and stuff to collect all of their disposable water bottles? Because the number of plastic water bottles I see in the trash can at my company alone. It just at headquarters baffles me. And at my last company, you know, we were going through cases and cases a day of plastic water bottles. And I advocated for us to move to like a reusable water bottle, but it just seemed like that was not even, like we, we can't even consider that. Everyone needs to have their disposable water bottles. And so I was just wondering if there was something like that being discussed at Ozarka or, you know, anywhere else. Well, I have, I have two responses. <laughs> First, uh, we do sell five gallon water coolers and we're happy to provide that service to your office building. <laughs> um, and two, we don't do collection, but commercial collection of just any, any recyclable is out there. Um, and I think TDS does that if they're still here. Um, so it's certainly possible. And in New York City, that's how they do it. New York City's is uh, an entirely different, because it is so densely populated, it, it is not analogous to most places. Um, but that's how they, they, they'll have contracts just to pull out all of the plastics um, from those office buildings. I'll also say, if I don't, if I can, that you probably don't see a lot of nickels and dimes in that trash can, do you? So uh, in, in New York and also Oregon and Iowa and Maine, uh, these are five cents, 10 cents. And so when a value is assi assigned to it, uh, it becomes valuable and it is not trash. And so dare I say, uh, you know, you could have quite a few people going through your trash if it was five or 10 cents. Uh, so I, you know, th there is something to be said about, uh, about the incentive in and of itself of uh, driving, you know, offices and, and others to, to see the value and recoup the value for themselves or for their customers. So I was struck by the Budweiser statistic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, I actually like a good Budweiser every now and then, so it's yeah. not a slam against the brand at all. But I'm wondering if you have approached them to actually put something on their can about deposit this responsibly. They do, uh, most of the beer companies do a great job about drive safely, drive home safely. And I would encourage you to really 
try, they are looking for good stories right now, and I think this would be a good story for them. <laughs> so I would encourage you to reach out and see if they couldn't put something on the can. I like the incentives. I mean, when I was in college a million years ago, we got five cents for every Coke bottle we returned, and the last five days of the month, our entire floor <laughs> Collected Clean as all the Coke, you know, we turned in our Coke <laughs> bottles and then went out to have lunch. So I would encourage you to really show that statistic to Budweiser. They have a big lobby in Austin, and I think you could make some progress with them on getting them to put it on the can. Like, I, don't be a jerk. Put this in a ooh, trash can. <laughs> I like that. Well, I, I, would, I, I would love a contact. Uh, and that's, that's one of the things I said, you know, I, I, we, we would love to work with Budweiser. Unfortunately, uh, there, are, there are some, you know, corporations that, that are a little, that would prefer to not work with NGOs. That's kind of what I said. You know, don't be scared of us. We're not scary. Uh, but, but it does work. And I will say uh, in, in, two th in 2017 or earlier in text data. Uh, lotto tickets were on that list. Like they were picking up so many lotto tickets at litter, and they did. They put on there, throw this away. You know, do not just throw this on the ground. Uh, and it worked. Lotto tickets aren't aren't on the top ten anymore. But uh, so I I think that's a great idea, Budweiser, if you're out there. Hello. Uh, <laughs> but I think that is an absolute thing. Fantastic. Yeah. It, it's a big old, yes, 10% ten, yes, 10 of all the trash on Texas uh, roadways is branded Budweiser. <laughs> so all you Bud drinkers out there, yeah. <laughs> tell a friend to tell a friend. That's right. And, tell them to call and, me. And that, um, you know, what struck me through all three presentations um, was that, you know, we've got all this great data and I, everybody identified bringing stakeholders to the table as kind of a critical next step. So for each of your three organizations, how do you... What process do your teams use to think through what that next step might be or who might be the next right stakeholder to reach out to? Like she was saying, like it could be the beverage companies themselves or the city or the office buildings. Um, I'd love to hear kind of how those brainstorming sessions are going with your teams. If you want to start, Maya. Sure. Well, our, my team is Brad over there. Hi, Brad. Uh, <laughs> not we are a small but mighty team, and a lot of it is sitting on who will talk to us. You know, and I, I love Liz. I love both Liz's. That Liz down there, she was one that said, "Okay, I'll talk to you." Uh, and so, I, we, it, the the value chain on these sorts of projects is just enormous. There are so many stakeholders, uh, and so we we work with. Texans by, by nature, you know, and, and then we, I went to Joni, so Joni, help me. <laughs> People will talk uh, and to so, us. Uh, but, but absolutely, <laughs> I think it's, it's all of the above. It is not only brainstorming who's the obvious, but, uh, but, but who we haven't thought of, and then who can we, you know, who can we beg to, to talk to us, <laughs> you know? What? Yeah, I would say um, because we are so local at Houston and Galveston, we try to think up what corporations or companies are local to us that we can engage in, talk to, um, who care about the environment around them, um, and also using Texas by nature. That was one reason that we applied and are so grateful to be a conservation wrangler so that um, we can start working with, with bigger corporations as well um, and talk to, like, experts who are in the field today, because um, we are, uh, American Bird Conservancy has been around a long time, but our program is three years old, so we are pretty new. Um, so yeah, anyone who's willing to talk to us, we'd <laughs> love to talk to you. <laughs> On the recycling front, the way we're thinking about it um, is actually working back from what we want our finished product to be. So we're looking at it through the lens of how are we going to get more um, our pet so we can drive up our recycled content and that means we're thinking through um, who are processors and then where do we know and and given the fact that you know there are certain place like there's always a move to do more recycling in Vermont which is wonderful but Vermont's not going to move the needle on how much recycled content we can put in our products so we need places that are big and substantial and so that that is one piece on the on the cons on conservation side of things you know I think we're, we're look we want to you know, continue to do that work to protect watersheds and, and, and collaborate with folks. So we're just, we're in general, we're open. Yeah. Um, Thank you. All right, next question. Go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you. My question is for Liz with Splash. Um, I think you, 
Well, actually, there's a correlation between the trash in the water, the farm to market road, and so on and so forth. But I, I imagine that you mentioned just now that your education of the trash along the coastline is probably limited to some geographical in your local region. Um, but I think that my brothers and sisters in the rural area a little north of you are your, your, counter, your problem. So how could we help you get your education further north? Yeah, I love that question. Um, so we do have online resources. Um, I would say we probably uh, cover like a within a two hour range of Houston and Galveston. So we are going starting to go much more uh, north to, like up in the uh, higher in the watersheds. Um, but our online resources are a great um, way to start getting uh, educators, like formal or informal, to start to share our message and share our lessons um, in the classroom or at a local like nature center. Um, because we do connect, I, uh, like uh, we work with you too. So like, let's say you're not on the coastline, but you're in Trinity River. And we can update our, our education, our educational, like even images so that it reflects what's happening in the Trinity River. Um, so I would say like uh, contact us if you have like specific uh, schools or um, educational programs in mind. Um, but yeah, that's definitely like one of our like goals is to continue to increase further in the watershed to clean those environments too because um, y'all in, in Dallas, are your trash is coming down to us but it's also affecting you guys up here. So we would love to eventually be like a statewide program. That'd be so amazing. Um, yeah. Hi, a uh, question for Mia. Uh, Rich uh, with Clear Lake, Texas. Uh, we do the inland waterways uh, centered around Grapevine and Louisville. So uh, that's our niche. niche. And uh, I was just back to your metrics. I was real happy not to see Modelo on there. So that means we have got <laughs> We picked up every Modelo can, and nothing has gone downriver. That's very reassuring to us on our end. Uh, and I want to know if there's any therapy offered for my boss, Don, that's out here about three, four days a week doing this. And we pulled down about 87,000 pounds last year of trash, and he's the man. Boy. Got the, got the arms to prove it, too, I'm sure. <laughs> well, you know, I tell you, it, uh, we've, we've, uh, we've gone down rabbit holes. We've, uh, we've picked up trash. We've got all sorts of, we know the brands, you know, we, we know what it is. We know where it is. I, I think now it's incumbent on us to do something big, you know, and, and, uh, and, uh, and sometimes big things are scary, you know, policy is, is scary, uh, but, uh, and, and changing the mindset of consumers is, is scary to, to, to businesses and, and folks, but, um, but I think that it's time, uh, dare I say, uh, that we did decide to do big things, uh, and, um, you know, as, as Liz said, we're at a 9 to 11 percent uh, recycling rate for, for people. PET, when she says our pet, she's talking about recycled PET. Uh, but, you know, right down the road uh, here in Dallas, there's a plant, Indorama Ventures. They make the bottle to bottle recycling, uh, and they're actually importing plastic uh, from China and Taiwan and other California. bottle bill states. You just know, California. Just California. Well, okay, I was there. I saw it with my, my own eyes. But, uh, but uh, so it, I think that there is a there is a culmination of problems uh, that, that we can come together and, and solve for the good of the environment and the good of the economy. Uh, you know, so <laughs> kudos to you for picking up all those Modelo cans and please put it in the Texas Litter Database. Uh, and please also think big and bold about how we can move past, you know, the scary stuff into the big, the big exciting stuff. So you don't have to do that anymore. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Well, we have, um, I have just one last question to wrap up this panel. Um, you know, we opened this panel talking about novel ideas and how, you know, we should all be using everybody's novel ideas to um, implement with our own activities. So some of us are doing recycling, some of us are doing habitat, you know, uh, all these different activities. So for the panel, I would like just a quick 30 second um, answer from each of you on how can lessons learned in litter cleanup and abatement be used for other conservation initiatives. So you, how you're collecting this data, how you're working with stakeholders, all of those things. What would you recommend to your you know, counterparts and other types of initiatives um, to take home with them? 
uh, I think being adaptive and going back to what was said this morning is you have to believe that your partners or your potential partners want to do the right thing. And I think bringing that sort of positive outlook to it will help smooth that pathway to getting something done. Um, but being adaptive so you can switch gears and pivot when needed is really important. Mm. Um, yeah, I would say, again, it's about um, who's, I think, considering um, accessibility. Um, how, are we, how are you getting your information out? Um, how can you work with your communities, your organizations, the people who you're trying to reach, uh, to reach them best? So there's that communication piece. And who's missing at your table, who you want at your table, um, I would say. Yes, and let's see. Oh, those are all excellent. I took mine. No, I'm kidding. Um, let's see. <laughs> I would say that, uh, um, you know, someone said earlier, I think the, the, the Wildlife Association is saying, you know, we work to incentivize landowners, and we, we go out to them, and we, we meet people where they are. And I think that's, that's what we need to do. We need to meet people where they are. And not just preach to our own choir, and not... Frankly, not just work with the people who do share our values. There's all sorts of people out there. And all of the people live in this world with us. And so let's meet them where they are. And so it might not be altruism. It might not be, you know, goodwill. But it might be the economy. It might be your land. It might be something. Something, something is going to meet someone where they are right now. And that is how you move them from the now to the future, as Joni says. You know, we, we really need to start start looking towards what's what's next where are we going as opposed to almost you know where we've been which which can be you know can be hard looking back sometimes that could you know be conflicting as, as Liz said let's look to the positive and look to the forward and uh, that, that's what I'd say there thank you <laughs> thank you again to Maya Liz and Liz for sharing today all right we are going to take a break and come back together at three o'clock for the final panel. So um, we'll see you in about 30 minutes.